and then it'll come up. Continue? Yep. Good evening, uh, everyone. Apologies for the slight delay. We've had a few internet troubles here, the wet weather playing havoc, I think, with our uh, internet. But thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, again, another one, I think this is about eight or nine sessions into our coach education series uh, that we've been running here at Cricket New South Wales to try and reach as many of you as we can, uh, considering we've had restrictions on being able to go out and see coaches face to face this year. So. We appreciate you giving up your time and know that you'll have a, a very informative session. Uh, as you'll see on the my right hand side, there is uh, Sixers BBL head coach and, and title winning coach from last year, Greg Shippard. Uh, and he's going to be joined shortly by Josh Layla, who's a uh, current BBL player and has also played in the Caribbean Premier League as well. So, so both Greg and Josh are, are going to talk through uh, all things coaching T20 cricket in no doubt what's going to be a very, very informative session. Um, before we do get started, though, I just want to let everyone know that all of the sessions that we've run so far and, and this one too have been uploaded will, and will be uploaded onto our um, Cricket New South Wales Coach Education YouTube channel. Uh, so for those of you who are subscribed to the Cricket New South Wales page, um, if you click on that and go on to playlists, you'll find the coach education uh, section there. And under there, you'll have all the videos that we've done, the um, webinar series. We've got uh, videos we've got done with our premier cricket coaches here in New South Wales as well. So all the information you need, all the sessions, if you'd like to go and revisit them or, or forward the link on to other coaches who may be new to the game, please feel free. Uh, and this session with Greg will be up there later this week. Uh, and finally, for those coaches, uh, community coaches at, within New South Wales who've gone back, I think last weekend would have been the beginning of community cricket, which is great to see given everything that's transpired over the last couple of months. This season, um, we've put together a welcome and an information pack to help get you started for this season. So within the pack is contained all sorts of things around the role of your coach, um, where you can turn to for support, what access and, and what resources you've got for support as well. Um, and we'll also give you a contact point for your coach and talent specialist who's there to, to be able to help you and support you through the start of the season um, and make sure that the boys and girls are out there um, enjoying their cricket, hopefully when this rain goes away and, and be able to provide uh, them with some assistance throughout the year. So. Uh, to access that, uh, you'll need to go and visit the Cricket New South Wales website. Um, then under Get Involved and Coaching Cricket, you'll find a link to register. Put in your details and then your coach and talent specialist from across New South Wales will get in contact to you and send you the PDF version of the document and then you'll be able to access all the uh, links and resources within. Um, but for now, uh, I'll pass over to Josh uh, and Greg. I'd like to thank both of them uh, initially for their time and, and thank you again for your time. Uh, and please enjoy the session. Thank you, guys. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, and thank you very much to everyone that's on the line tonight. Um, we've had an overwhelming response with nearly 300 coaches coaches registered for tonight. So hopefully they'll be on and listening to, uh, as Bill said, the man to his right, the absolute doyen of T20 coaching in Australia. And I know we weren't like that at all, Greg Shippard. Um, We'll need to be quick tonight, guys. Uh, I've got a little note here. The Chronicles of Shippy uh, and Coaching could well be a 10-part miniseries on Netflix um, and something we're probably all, all desperate to watch during COVID, right. but we've got about 45 minutes tonight. So I apologise in advance that there'll be some things that, you know, that your ears prick up to that we'll only go, we'll, we'll only, sorry, scratch the surface on and there'll be some things that we'll dig a little bit deeper on. Um, again, we apologise in advance, but we will have some time for questions at the end. So if there's anything we haven't answered, feel free to drop some questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many of them um, at the end as we can. So um, we've been talking for a long time now. It's, we might as well hear from Shippy. How are you going, mate? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, thanks, Josh. And uh, just like to say, you know, welcome to all the coaches that are online and I salute you and doff my hat to you for your involvement in coaching. Uh, Coaching for me is being like a parent, is being like a teacher and their revered roles in our community and for everyone online tonight to be here to uh, listen and hopefully get some worthwhile information that improves their coaching skills 
which indeed has an influence on the players that we interact with. Um, I say, well done. Don't don't panic in terms of time. I'm much. I'm very happy to come back again and fill in the gaps. Uh, a special hello up there in Darwin to Tony Judd, who was one of my early assistants uh, as a coach in my early years, and he's still coaching coaches. So once you're hooked uh, by the game of cricket and coaching, um, it stays with you. I think that might be a bit of a segue into the first question, Shippy. So um, you debuted for the Western Australian Cricket Association about 43 years ago, give or take, and you're still involved in the game um, in Australia at first class level. Um, why have you decided to stay involved for so long? Well, I'm just glad I'm still involved in the game. It has been a long time, but it's become, I guess, apart from my family, the love of my life, uh, it, it, helping players, being involved with the dressing room, uh, representing organisations and states, uh, as I have in Western Australia, Tasmania, Victoria and, and in New South Wales. So it's, been a, it's been a wonderful journey uh, and uh, it's given me a lot of satisfaction. Um, so, you know, I, I like the nitty gritty of the game. I love the game and I love its three formats and I'm, I'm really sold on this, the latest format that's, uh, you know, hit, hit Australia and hit world cricket. You know, back in 2005, um, you know, I discovered it in London and got fully immersed in it. And I guess this current generation of young players is, you know, really they've grown up with T20 cricket. It's a wonderful format of the game. And I do respect and love, obviously, the other two formats as well. Absolutely. And we'll we'll get into, I guess, the specific advantages around T20 shortly and hopefully some tips and tricks at how to master it for the for the coaches that are on the line. But taking it way back to um, what you said at the start, everyone that's on the line tonight is coaching or has coached in the past or will hopefully coach in the future. So it's something very passionate to, to most people on the line. Um, in previous chats, you talked about making how you made your way through uni and what paid the bills, um, and what's your trade, Chippy, outside of outside of cricket coaching. Yeah, well, I was an all sport player as a, as a youngster in football, soccer, cricket, and tennis, and I became a tennis coach uh, around sixteen, and and then going into university. So I sort of paid my way through university by being a a cricket coach and uh, and and went into um, the University of WA as a, as a young teacher. So uh, my cricket coach for Western Australia, Daryl Foster, actually ran the course. And so we, uh, he looked up for us as well. Uh, you know, he gave us time for cricket and time for study. And it was a, a great combination we had in those early days. So I, I do have a teaching background. I, co I taught for seven years as a phys ed teacher. Uh, so I'm sort of used to, if you like, loving sport and organising groups of people around the improvement, improving skills, improving understanding uh, of the game. And, and that's what you're there to do. And, and uh, that's what I've been doing, I guess, for a long, long time. But surrounded by, you know, a lot of great people that have uh, given me experiences and helped me along the way, both in the playing, uh, in my playing time, but also through my coaching phases in you know, three or four different environments now. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I, I could be guessing, I wasn't around the first class scene or, or any professional sport in the mid 90s, but the visions that I have when I look back now, when I think about a kid watching sport on TVs, coaches had this um, almost authoritarian role. Um, and the longer that I've been in cricket, the more mature I get, I appreciate coaches are just teachers. Um, what is it about having a teaching background, do you think that's helped you, you know, your experience as a tennis coach? And you've even spoken before about being a parent, how all those things sort of go into the melting pot and provide you with skills to be an excellent coach. Could you touch on, on the similarities there? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, coaches are, are there to shift performance, to uh, to guide you know, players or teams towards, you know, visions, goals, you know, winning championships, uh, winning titles, or just improving uh, skill sets of the various people within a club or a team or, or right across the, the board. And so that is a step-by-step -step process and, and you need to have the ability to exchange ideas, to, to present knowledge and to see whether it's landed and it's being learnt. 
Um, one of the sort of things that I've discovered, you know, through experience is that uh, if you're telling people all the time, they tend to forget. If you're teaching people skills, they remember them. But if more importantly, if you involve the group or the player in the process, they're likely to learn. And so I think that's the important part. Involve them in the process, you know, use feedback, get, get the players talking, uh, get them answering questions. And the more experienced you become, you learn to trust uh, getting information from those that are playing the game more so than you, you as the observer. I think that's a, you touched on it right at the end there. It's a, it's quite a refined art to to get your ant to allow the players to give you the answers. Um, I would think about like I I would think about if I'm coaching an under eleven side that keeps making the same mistakes after mistakes. One, I've probably got to have a look at the way that I'm coaching them. Um, but two, if players, uh, what what's the question I want to ask? Giving the players the platform, I think, is a really strong point. As you said, it allows them to learn rather than you just telling them. But um, for our, our coaches, I'll, I'll, jump in, I'll jump in there, and I always yeah. start the process with the team is, and I use a little uh, a set of words called vapor. And so I say to the players, starting with V, what's our vision here, guys? And this this can happen pre-session, or it can be for the vision for the season. And so we come in and say, what's the vision? What's the focus for tonight? And then A is for analyze. We analyze where we're at in terms of, it might be the game that's coming up or the season, starting a season or finishing a season. We're, we're looking to analyze with our measures around the game, where we sit. We're wanting to come up with a plan uh, for the session or the game or the season or the career. So we, we come up with plans. Then we've got to go out and action action those things and it might be in a net session you go out and you, you have your 20 minute 30 minute session you see what's happening you bring the group in and you sort of and you have a conversation around how things are going are we meeting the targets that we're looking to to focus on in the session um, and if it's t20 cricket it might be hitting balls on the ground in the air offside leg side bowlers committing at the top of their mark about making a choice of line or length or bowling to match the field, all those sort of variations and combinations that go into a performance. And then your review at the end of the session, and that's where you do a lot of your learning. It's a game of review and evaluation. So we do have conversations about uh, assessing this assessing this session. So it might be for batters, you know, they, they might give themselves a gold, silver or bronze rating. They might give themselves a score out of 10. But it's interesting to hear the feedback at the end of the session about the whole group, how they felt the session has gone. If you're running a club and you've got 40 players, obviously you're time poor and you might pick a half a dozen responses from around the group about how the session went. And so that's sort of the learning process through my eyes. Yep, no, that's an absolute excellent framework. And as, as I said at the start, we're gonna to touch on a lot of stuff and I, I had it in my notes here. I don't think I told our viewers to do it, but please feel free if you're not going to do it, grab it now, quick, a pen and a paper and start writing things like the vapor down. Um, if not, we'll try to put it together a one pager after afterwards to, to summarize some of this stuff. But um, Shippy, you've touched uh, before in chats we've had about coaches being learners, leaders and performers. Um, something you spoke really passionately about. Could you, you touch on that for a moment? Yeah, look, in my development as well, I, you know, in terms of learning for me, um, I, I, I try and be an expert, if you like, if I'm, if I'm allowed to call myself an expert with a beginner's mind. And so I'm very curious about understanding the coaching process. So I go to as many coaching courses as I can. I, I still read a lot of books around coaching, but I sort of did some work through identifying uh, a lot of American coaches and, and, and the boiled down version of a coach or an elite coach, the three key characteristics about their, them was that they were performers, they were learners and they were leaders. So in terms of performers, you know, you're, it, it, it's a bit of theatre really when you're in front of that group or in front of that club or indeed, indeed here tonight. It's about, it's about you know, sending your message, having some light and shade around that message, 
and 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 spreading the word, spreading the the vision uh, as best you can. And so that, there's a bit of performance art in that, and it's about giving and receiving feedback. Uh, in terms of being a learner, well, you know, th that's about understanding the game. Good coaches have great product knowledge, and so they're understanding, you know, th they're understanding the game, uh, the opposition's game, and the individual's players' game. So they're three key important coaching tenets, is, and, and from a player's point of view, in terms of setting themselves up for a game, it's important for them to know their game, what their strengths and weaknesses are, the opposition and the game itself. And um, there's signals and guidelines every coach provides to their team with bat and ball in the field and from a team point of view, that right. go together to make a quality performance. Uh, in, and in terms of being a leader, I mean, I think we all understand leadership. It's about you know the positivity, the optimism, the uh, the the energy, the work ethic, and uh, you know going out and doing, getting your hands dirty, and and getting the job done. That's that's leadership. Uh, being consistent, being honest, being open, and being able to take criticism or or uh, feedback that doesn't always sit sit well with you. Yeah. I think in a previous conversation we had, I said, how have you managed to evolve your understanding of cricket in Australia over 43 years, thinking that it was a challenge to stay relevant for that amount of time? And you said simply, I'm a learner. I'm learning every day and I'm trying to know as much as I can about the game and as the game changes. Um, what's the lubricant? What was it? What's the lubricant for change, should be? Uh, curiosity is the lubricant for progress. For growth, progress, perfect. That's, progress, that's what, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I guess over time as well and using experience, you know, we all chase perfection, but don't let perfection get in the way of progress. And so, you know, whilst we always set the bar, the bar as high as we can, we also need to still, you know, uh, reward the, the small steps that players take or teams take along, along the way. So, you know, in, in all of our debriefs, the first thing is, is to we search for the positives, the things that went well during the day. And... And, and then at an elite level, you know, we tend to give it some space uh, before we we sort of we, we turn our minds to, you know, the, the opportunities uh, that, that arise out of poor performance, if you like. So a bit more difficult uh, with the individual and teams uh, that sort of you see them and then you don't. Uh, but, you know, it's still an important part of the process. Absolutely. Um, and you'd spoken before about an incredible example of a bit of the performance, but um, a process you went through with some some kid, kids at the time that have now developing into really good first class players. And hopefully there's a few Australian players in amongst them with one of your academies um, with our neighbours in Victoria um, about sending them tasks to do to learn about the game. You touch on that for a few minutes. I thought that was absolute yeah. dynamite for coaches. Yeah. yeah, sure. I was lucky enough to have uh, the Cricket Australia High Performance Group, which was the best 15s and 16s, which now is Sam Harper and Sutherland and Merlo and the young kids that are coming through Victoria now. And and as we would introduce the session, we you know I would say to them, "What's happening in world cricket?" And uh, what's that? And so they would have to respond. They knew that they would have to have a response for me so I could whiz around the group and we would identify what was happening in world cricket. We'd identify good performances, bat ball and in the field and the players wouldn't had to describe those those things that they noticed. And so there, there was a flow of information about what the best were doing and what shaped a, a quality performance. And so then we would say, okay, what are the Victorian team doing in reference to that? You know, because this is your target. You guys are wanting to play there. What are you seeing that they're doing? So you're giving them you're giving them cues about the targets that they should be that looking towards. And so I was able to, as an ex-Victorian coach, also add information around what they used to be like at training, how they used to conduct themselves at training, what focuses the team would and the squad would have, you know, in a training session leading up to a Shield game or a one day game or indeed a T20 game. Then they also had WhatsApp challenges where they had to identify themselves, you know, things that an article that they'd seen or a moment in a cricket game or 
when uh, uh, when momentum had changed in a game that they'd watched or an article they'd seen in a newspaper, they had to put that on the WhatsApp group to share and players were given targets to share information across the group. And the session would unfold and we would be obviously chasing whatever the, the focus for the session was. It might have been swing kings or spin kings or uh, a short ball attack. Uh, it might have been facing uh, wet, wet balls, bowling with wet balls, you know, whatever the variety you had to play with as a coach. And then we'd, we'd again break the session up, stop the session, right, we'd identify who's been the best bowler, who's been the best batter, why they were considered the best batters or best bowlers. And so there's this continual dialogue going around the squad that was identifying, reviewing good performances. It's a very subtle way of giving a lift up to yep. certain players that might sometimes not get that. And sometimes a coach can't be looking in every direction. And so the players often would, would pick out players that you know were doing well. So that, I think that was good. Gets them talking, gets them used to providing feedback. Uh, and then with, at the end of the session, they had to rank their performance you know, out of 10. And players are notoriously good at under ranking themselves. So as a coach, you were able to then sort of say, well, that five out of 10 you gave yourself, I saw those cover drives, you didn't get out tonight your cut shots are really improving, I would see that as an 8 out of 10 performance. And so you got them being more relevant around their review of a session or how they were progressing. So some yeah. of the tricks of the trade, I guess. Yeah, excellent. I think there's some really valuable takeaways there for a lot of the people on the line. Um, on to T20 cricket specifically. So um, we have some really spirited conversation in internally and externally um, from our offices around T20 cr cricket. Um, given my current playing history, um, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate, no doubt. Um, but, you know, it's one of the things we talk about at Cricket New South Wales is we've completely lost Shippy. Is he gone? No, I'm here. You're there? I'm, yeah, I'm here. Don't worry. Good man, Ship. Uh, we'll keep going. Um, so one of the things we talk about um, or that I love about T20 cricket is the time pressure that's put on to put on players. So um, people yeah. talk about the fundamentals of the game, you know, go out the window because the players start doing something silly. But I feel like the, the result is coming from that pressure. And that's what something that, again, as I play more and more T20 cricket and you get put on the spot in situations where you need to problem solve. Um, that's a beauty of T20 cricket that I think where we need to provide more of our, our players with so they can learn and develop quickly. Um, do you have any thoughts on the the positives around T20 cricket for young players? Yeah, look, I'm all in on T20 cricket. I mean, as I said, this, this new generation, the last 15 years that it's been in and around the world, it's, it's the thing that the, the young players see the most. Uh, they play the most of it because a lot of the you know, everyone's time poor and everyone wants to get games on. The fundamentals of T20 cricket aren't any different to the fundamentals of, of uh, one day cricket or red ball cricket. It's just that time pressure that you talked about uh, is the issue and it becomes, I think that's more exciting for the players. It obviously is for the crowds that watch the game. They see this and I see T20 as a like a, like a, a thriller, watching a thriller on TV or reading a a, a, a sci-fi thriller novel, there's twists and turns and ups and downs, you know, there's changing momentum, there's critical moments in a game, there's a one over turnaround that we always talk about, so the game can be flipped on its head, so, you know, it, it, it's it's dynamic, the players want to play it, uh, it, it it's led to innovation, it's, it, it's 240 set plays and events that, you know, the it is about the fundamentals. So from a, I don't see how our fundamentals aren't anything but enhanced. Um, we can still go and teach the hitting skill. We can teach a cover drive, a cut. All the shots are relevant. Front foot, back foot, you just don't leave the ball. Uh, you, you're not encouraged to leave the ball. There's only 120 of them. And we encourage, you know, 80 plus scoring shots out of those 120. It generally equals a winning performance. From a yeah. bowling point of view, 
Um, that it's a game of decisions and execution, you know, with bat, ball and in the field. So uh, those those fundamentals don't change. I think it's uh, it's it's again something that we shouldn't step back from. We should step into uh, and, and really embrace the the the. The, the challenge to the mind that it makes. And that's where we could probably be a little bit better in our coaching is understanding more about the mental skills of the game. And I'm still learning and reading. There's a great book out there called Mindful Cricket by Graham Winter that gives you some clues on uh, teaching and coaching the mental skills of the game. Um, so, you know, oh, I'm, I'm all in. Uh, it's been, you know, it's been great fun. And I know that the players are all in on it as well. Yeah, I think when you, um, I was thinking about it on the drive on the way into that tonight, and I was thinking about the fundamentals and what um, people who are oppositional to the idea might say. But I think when you say the word fundamentals, I think people teach uh, uh, automatically think technical, which is not a million miles away from the truth. But like you just spoke about, I think. If you're teaching the fundamentals and executing those techni the technical fundamentals out of your 120 balls with the bat, that's going to go a long way. But there are fundamentals to playing the game of cricket. Yeah, and I'll jump in there, Josh, and I'll sort of say they are, you know, for me, they are the physical side of the game, the mental side of the game, the technical side of the game, the tactical side of the game, and the team. And, and teams, there's fundamentals across each of those of those five key points there. And then we do get caught up in technique and technique yeah. is important. But, you know, when I sort of, when I go and sometimes do a presentation and I'll just put fundamentals up on the board. All right, so, and then I'll work off that word as, as my session. And so it is, I'll say to the players, fun, right? That's what we're here for, for tonight. We're here for fun and, and we're here to be satisfied and, and everyone's got a responsibility to make that happen. We want the session to be competitive and robust and there'll be, you know, there'll be success and there'll be f failure. So that's fun. D is for decisions. It's a game of decisions. Batters have got to make a decision and bowlers have got to make a decision. And then you've got to A for action that, all right? So the batter has to see the ball out of the hand and make a choice. His choices are, you know, to, to hit it, and, and and hit it and where to hit it and how hard to hit it. And so around how hard to hit it, I talk about squash, punch and crunch and deflect. So my Sydney Sixers players are being creating and developing a language around the batting options a batter's got as squash, punch, crunch and deflect. So that's batting 360 as we like to talk about it. From a bowling point of view, the bowler at the top of his mark's got a choice. He set the field with his captain, he needs to bowl a, a ball that relates to that field. So it, it, in terms of line, length, pace, angle, if you're a spinner, how hard, how, what ball you're bowling, wrong and slider, whatever. Um, so that's the decision and action part. The mental part of fundamental is the underestimated side of the game. And that's where we need to sort of get in, watch, you know, what's the clarity of your thinking? Are you thinking clearly under pressure? Are you playing with the scoreboard, not against the scoreboard? If things aren't going well, what's your routine for clarity of mind to give yourself the best chance to make that best decision? So it is about that internal narrative in your mind. You're encouraging them to talk and think positive rather than negative in, in, your, in your mind. It's about resilience, adaptability. They're the mental skills that give you the best chance to make that best decision. And then the, the S is for skills, satisfaction and success, I guess. So there's sort of a presentation in one, one F word there. And, uh, and I think, uh, again, that just highlights for me and to the players, the mental side of the game that can often be neglected. Yeah. I think that's we're going to have to push on, but that's um, hopefully there are some questions there. We've only scratched the surface of a little bit there. Like you said, there's probably a whole presentation there on fundamentals, but yeah. hopefully some people will send some questions through inquiring a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so Greg Shippard, renowned T20 coach, BBL. You know, you're walking down the street with your BBL09 trophy over your shoulder and your your Sixers cap on, not too dissimilar to what you what you're wearing now. 
and you're looking at it, you've stumbled across a game of T20 cricket, might be first grade, could be, you know, 16 year old rep cricket. Could you give us a five minute peek into some of the things that might stand out through your mind or to your cricket eyes that maybe some of us might not see? So from a talent ID point of view, what are some of the things, you know, that you, you look for um, to see if players are playing the game um, with some form of, you know, long term ability? Yeah, I uh, yeah I went for my walk yesterday afternoon and I stumbled across a, a young club a club of youngsters I think for fifteen down to I guess about eight and yeah. uh, in a net session and I and I watched and I just looked for movement I looked for the way the player the batters moved the bowlers moved I looked for technique I looked for whether the the decision the player made made sense from a batting point of view. That there's a ball that I saw as a cut shot. Did he cut it, or did he, you know, or there's a ball to drive. Did he drive it? Um, what sort of skills and movement patterns did they have? What sort of choices and decisions were they making from a bowling point of view? I'm looking for, you know, control, and I'm looking for action and rhythm and run up and uh, and and those sort of things, you know, within within the uh, the visuals that I'm looking at a player. So it's movement, balance. Uh, yeah, it's look, it, 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 it involves technique, but it invo also involves execution. So um, and then when you're in the position, to, you're in a club and you're looking to pick players through grades or elite performance, uh, at elite performance level, you're looking to identify the talent, you're looking to select it, in a certain role, in a certain position, you're looking to develop it through your preparation, your training over time, and you're looking to manage it, their ups and downs, because it's a game of failure. Only the elite and the best win win more often. You know, so the people like Steve Smith and Ricky Ponting, those sort of guys, you know, every third performance they're having a win. The rest of us, Josh, you and me and others, are having a win every seven, eight, nine times. So we're dealing with failure more often than with success. And so, you know, once you're dealing with young players, you're trying to understand and carry them and lift them through the challenges of the ups and downs of, of cricket. And, and that's the beauty of cricket because it teaches you both sides of the coin. There's winning, there's losing, there's, there's all those individually and also from a team point of view. So. Um, that's what I look for. Um, and then you have to transition when at a lead level, you've got to transition players in and out of sides and that's a delicate operation. But again, if you're dealing with honesty, uh, you know, everything's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, you've given me a couple of segues there. I'll go with uh, the first one, which is um, right off the back of what you just said and players dealing with failure. T20 cricket can be a really tricky place for people to find their feet. It's a it's a game of roles. It's not a, a longer form game where everyone will get their chance yeah. Yeah. You know, when the time will come. Um, yeah. For a coach juggling a young bunch of players that might say they don't always get a go or as you progress, you know, further and further up the pathway, um, you want to create players for specialist positions finding the right seat on the bus for players is really, really important. And Josh Philippe is one that we've spoken about before that you've sort of managed his way into the, you know, from being in the squad to into the team to now in his dominant role. Can you talk about how you might navigate finding the right seats on the bus for particular players? You know, if that's tough, if that's easy or some, some advice for people around doing that? Yeah, well, so with, with, if I get my squad together, I would have, be having you know, conversations with them around their likely role, but I would want to, want to open the door as well to the possibility of them having everything. And yeah. so they're sort of being, they're no constraints. So, you know, I would, I'd describe my bat as I say, I want you to have the capacity to be a an all-rounder. We love all-rounders in Australian cricket and the Australian coaches talking prolifically about all-rounders. So, a batting all-rounder for me is someone who can play through three phases of the game and yes. bat one to six or one to seven. And so, you know, if I get my openers in, I'm saying I want Josh, you or Dan Hughes at the top of the order. I want you to have the capacity to think your way through, problem solve through um, each of those three phases and I'll see you at the end 
you know, 84 not out or 94 not out. That's the ideal yeah. circumstance. But with Jordan Silk in the middle there, you know, uh, he, you know, a 30 and a strike rate of 130 for him is is a is a win for our team. And to dig us out of holes is a is a is a win for him. And so you become a role player, circumstance player, um, and that sort of five to seven player needs to be thinking about having the tools to strike rate at 200 at the moment with us. And so. You would obviously dumb that down the further down the, you know, the pecking order in terms of age that you're dealing with. But I would be framing my conversations with younger players that I want you to work towards, you know, being able to bat from one to six. You might find yourself in a role that doesn't agree with your temperament at the moment, but we'll do our best across the course of the season when you're developing talent to, you know, shift roles around and give people an opportunity to bat in different positions. And I think that's healthy at the younger ages. Obviously, when we're playing for sheep stations, you know, that from time to time needs to be earned. As Philippi did, uh, he gave us great signals that he had the capacity to uh, bat through three phases. He showed us how clever and innovative he was, yeah. um, you know, at the back end of an innings and we, and we gave him the opportunity at the top and he's flourished nicely. Um, we do have targeted players in the middle. So uh, it's again, it's how you frame it. The same thing from a bowling point of view, you know, we want to be saying to our bowling group that we want you to have the capacity to open the bowling, bowl through the middle with the field out and under that mental pressure at the end when you know it's attack, attack, attack. And so an all round bowler to me is someone who can do that. So if you think of the Sydney Sixers bowling group, if you like. We've got O'Keefe who can bowl with the new ball. We've got Menenti who can bowl with the new ball. Pope can bowl five, six and through the middle. All our bowlers can bowl uh, with the yeah. new ball and finish from a fast bowling point of view. You know, Jackson, Bird, Abbott, Dorshus can all, you know, start with the new ball and finish at the end. Uh, we're all still trying to improve, uh, no doubt, but we've still got yeah. room for improvement. But you know, we're chasing all round players in, in that sense. Same as from a fielding point of view, I want inner ring fielders and outer ring fielders. And so I want everybody to have the capacity and to train in their preparation around inner ring plays and outer ring plays. Just taking it all in. Trying, yeah, to, think about, trying to think if I fit the bill. I don't know if I've got the outer ring covered, mate. Um, so long as you're giving first impressions, when you throw that first ball in from the boundary and you give the signal that your wings, your wings operating and that's over the pegs and you've attacked the ball and you've you know given that sign to the opposition that they don't want to take you on, you've already saved a run for your team. So we encourage that right across the group. Good man. Well, we'll try to move on to, again, as I knew we would, we're sort of running low on time. So we'll try to move, you know, to, to some sixes specific stuff. Um, and you've touched on them a little bit um, throughout the chat, but in a previous conversation we have, we've had, you spoke about the F words being the, I don't want to do it, the foundation for your side. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the F words? Um, you can rattle off as many as you want, but what they more about what they mean for the team. Yeah, yeah. Well, when we walk through the door, when I walk through the door, it's about selling your plan to the group. And, and I'm, I'm selling to our group about it's called winning by design. All right, that this process and our plan is something that we've all worked together on and we've come up with. Uh, I'll obviously lead the way in terms of that, but I'll be listening to my leaders all the time around ideas and thoughts that they have. And so Winning by design is, is designed to make sure that our, when we do win, it's not by fluke. It is it's something that we can we can use in preparation uh, before a game and focus on these things. It's about developing your own language. And so we've hit on this, these key words for us, and I'll fire some off and you may wish to delve into some of them. So in, in the old days, we grew up uh, in my era with P words pressure, patience, partnerships, persistence, things like that. 
And with Victoria, I used the C words, you know, con concise, communication, uh, collaboration, uh, cooperation, those sort of things. But this is set for T20 cricket. Here we go. It's important <laughs> that we're fresh, we're focused, that we pay attention to fundamentals, flexible, we're fearless, we're, we're full of fun, we're forensic, we, we enjoy feedback, first impressions, family and friends, failure, and the what the F moment. <laughs> and I'll call that flip, what the flip moment. So these are the things that are, that are driving, they're on the board every time we walk in the room and we can, if we want to go there, we can, if we don't, we don't have to. We've got our measures up on the board, our inner ring measures, outer ring measures. The players have done their homework around preparing for the opposition in terms of checking our vision and data and information about uh, the opposition so that they're ready to play and understand if there's a moment in the game where they need to change tack, then they've got that information stored up in their minds through their preparation. They train to prepare to play at their highest level. And so there's always a focus at training around that. So they're the F words and they've worked particularly well for us in creating our own team language of, of, of assessment and preparation working yeah. well. I think you do, you do a little bit of reading around team cultures and the idea of creating your own language is one that pops up a lot um, and would challenge any other coaches to, to, to get out there and try to do the same thing. Um, what the F is the what the F moment, Greg? Well, that's uh, the, cricket provides these amazing uh, performance uh, moments um, that can be both positive and negative and um, they happen in cricket and sometimes they set you back uh, and you need to reevaluate. Sometimes, you know, it's something that's like a personal bet, best there to be celebrated. So the two that spring to mind last year for us were uh, when we went down and played the Stars, Marcus Stoinis, one of the best T20 innings I've ever seen in my life, if not the best. Total control, 147 not out. He just blew us away. He had an answer for everything we dished up. Um, and so in the in the rooms after the game, you know, we were pretty downcast and we were devastated and, you know, we our season was on the edge. And so when we looked at our F words, the message that came to me was we needed to be out of that performance. We needed to be forensic. We needed to go back, crunch the data. We needed to look at the vision bowling group. They need to have some, you know, good, hard uh, conversations around you know, what options we had next time round, because we were likely to be playing them in the semi-finals and the finals. And so we had to be forensic. We went back and, and did our homework and we uh, and we readjusted and reset our performance around Marcus. And fortunately, it did, you know, we got a good result out of it. Uh, on the positive side of the coin, we were gone for all money against the Sydney Strikers. Josh Hazelwood walks out the bat, hadn't batted for donkey's years in a T20 game. Peter Siddle bowling at the top of the mark under the pump and Josh has played three consecutive fours and the game was done. Well, what a moment, what an F the moment that was. Um, so we were able to celebrate that after the game and, you know, it really lifted the group. So there's, there's games that, you, that provide you that impetus, impetus and energy uh, and there's games that, you know, um, put you uh, on your back foot. So it's about sort of evaluating those and, and turning those circumstances around. I think I love the, I love the winning by design. It's, um, I love the winning by design. Like yeah. T20 seems so frantic and I've certainly been in some teams where um, the game, you spoke before, are you playing against the scoreboard? Are you playing with the scoreboard? I felt like, you know, you've played a lot of T20 cricket. There's certainly times as a team where you feel like the game's getting away from you, but this idea of winning by design just gives you that mentality that there's a lot more things in control. I'm not sure if there's an F word for that. Um, you touched on performance measures without sharing too many trade secrets um, for some inquisitive coaches out there. Are there some milestones or some things that you um, you believe would lead to success in, in a match in T20 cricket that you work off? Yeah, there's, there's some important parts of the game itself and understanding is there's, there's, 
There's the things that you do control. So you control your own performance, the personalities in the team, the, the things that are the uncontrollables, are the conditions. All right, so it's important to assess the conditions, you know, before every game and it's it's uncontrollable, but you need to be aware of it and manage it and work work with it again, like the scoreboard and the opposition. It is about understanding them and 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 their strengths and weaknesses. So a lot of work goes into understanding those things. But in taking care of your own performance, you know, for us, it's it's things like um, it's things like celebrating this squash, punch, crunch and deflect process, the uh, how to score runs, uh, 80 scoring shots in a game, uh, minimising overs plus 10, which are an indicator from a bowling evaluation point of view that if you can minimise them, your bowlers are actually matching the fields that they're setting. And so this is a good thing. Overs less than three. Yeah. Uh, what right people, right places is prominent on our board. And that's called, like in football terminology, that's sort of uh, unrewarded running, if you like, and, yep. and getting the best players with the best arms into the most important positions. So uh, if there are any little weaknesses for whatever reason in your team at a particular time, it's important that they're covered and minimised. So there's an enormous amount of work done with the Silks and the Smiths and the Abbots and, and the Henriques of the world to get themselves into those positions. So you, you know, they are a mental, mentally and physically exhausted at the end of these T20 processes because they've made the effort to get there and and do do the business. Ones and twos are really important for us, as are fours and sixes. Man of the match performances, uh, personal bests are, are 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 important. The one percenters, the one percenters in the game, the little things that are often, uh, you know, dusted away. You know, we like to celebrate and identify them in our post-match reviews as well. Things that are captain not so obvious. We spend a lot of time talking about those things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I've all just right. noted a few of those down. I'll take those with me if that's all right. We'll be um, watching out for you this year. <laughs> um, uh, and then just finally, we'll talk about maybe just the team environment. I've got here, you know, training session, but maybe just a, a lead up to a game, what training could look like, depending on, you know, whether you're coming off a, a win or a loss for some, something tells me that might not change a lot. Yeah. So uh, how do you lead up to a game in terms of your prep? Is it one day? Is it two? Is it three? How do team meetings work? And then also, I probably should ask this later, but also how important the captain is. You've spoken that Moses has been a great ally for you and again, not not through accident that you've got a really good skipper and have had a lot of success as well, but one lead up to the game and then to the role of the captain for you in T20 cricket. Yeah, lead up to the game. Obviously, we are a day out. We will have a, a, a meeting before we go and train. So we'll talk about the opposition. We'll, refu we'll review on our F words um, and we'll have those conversations. I'll introduce some general themes and, and, and have some general conversation about uh, the training to come, the opposition, the conditions we're likely to play in as I've identified. Um, I'll defer to the captain to, to uh, have a few words around any observations he's got uh, to share with the group. Um, and then we tend to break up into our skill sets. And so our bowling coach will take the bowling group. Our batters will go with an, another skills coach and they will have their designated conversations about the respective uh, set up for the game and um, and then I'll float between both of those groups and throw my two penneth worth in from time to time and then we go out we, we have specific training focuses um, we have conversations within training sessions there's a lot of rotation a lot of flexibility yeah. a lot of uh, bowling through the phases uh, different new balls mid-range balls old balls and um, we train with variety uh, we train to explore as well. Uh, not too much before a game. If we're two days out, we'll explore and innovate and create and and regroup if we need to. Uh, we go through our training. Uh, that's pre pre game as well as the day before. So we have two two net sessions. A lot of players are just happy to to not be involved in the net session on the day of the game, but to go out and just loosen up 
they've done their thinking, they've done their physical preparation the day before they're ready to play. Yeah. So there's, as you know, there's uh, you know some favourite teams love favourite warm-ups, and I encourage all coaches to find you know some games that the players respond to. Uh, they're competitive beasts. They like winning and losing, even in any sort of warm-up, whether it's a throwing competition or it's a soccer competition or a, any sort of tennis ball activity is always good fun and sets the, the mood right. Uh, making sure they do their fielding, appropriate fielding. Um, you know, ground balls, we have the fielding fives, five in straight, five to the right, five to the left, then five uh, in the air, running back, all those sorts of things, a little uh, tick the box exercises to make the player ready to play. And then, then you've got to step back and let them play. Yeah. And, uh, and having a great captain is absolutely critical. It's sort of over to him uh, uh, on the field. There might be an odd suggestion from time to time, but you know, really with Moses, you don't need his, his level of thinking is, is absolutely elite uh, and comparable to Cameron White, who was another wonderful captain that I had involvement with. So it's over to Moses and he debriefs beautifully as well. So there's a coach in the making there post his career whenever he wants. There's no doubt about that if he wants to do that. Uh, so, you know, we're lucky at the moment. There's a lot of hunger in the group to, to play well and succeed and achieve, uh, you know, successful goals personally and individually. Be a big season this year because there's another big IPL contract. So players will have their eye on our title, but also on the other opportunities around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And there's obviously the challenges with what's happening in the world at the moment. No doubt it'll be a bit of a different season for everyone. Yeah, it'll be hub, hub life potentially early on in the tournament and then hopefully after Christmas uh, we'll break out into some normality for us all. And uh, yeah, it's pleased to see Victoria crashing out of lockdown in the next couple of days. Good. Um, Greg, is there anything, I know you're a very well prepared man, but before we move over to some questions, is there anything um, that you think we might have left out that you'd like to touch on? Um, oh gee, I think we've we've you know our, we've, our, our discussion has been quite broad here. Um, I could go in various directions, I guess. Um, routines for me are pretty important uh, in terms of you know a, an individual you know in the game uh, yep. from from a batting perspective. You know, it's it's time to switch on when the you know, you've done your thinking about the conditions and you've done the thinking about here's the bowler and here's the game situation. And so it's about that, you know, the player having their physical routine about getting themselves ready. But when when Josh Ladder's at the top of their mark, this is where my mind is starting to focus in. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's clear, it's ready to respond to the ball. So I'm watching, watching, I'm looking for cues. I've seen the field out there. I'm looking for ball release then I'm looking for instinct to take over, making the crispest, clearest, committed decision that I can make at the time. And then I go into, into execution, the physical process of, of hitting, hitting the ball. So yeah. uh, for me, that routine is, but the most important one after that is, is the review of what's just happened. And in T20 cricket, that is dynamically shortened. So you know, bowlers are trying to hurry that process for you. And so that 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 reflect, relax and refocus is an important little three R step by step process. So again, reflect on what's just happened, take your relax time and then reset the routine. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And cricket, we 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 look at cricket looking forwards, right? The next ball, the next ball. But we understand it by looking backwards. All right. So yeah. just yeah. think about that. That's why that review and reflection is really important. So you'll learn something from that ball you just played. You played it well. Pat on the back mentally. If you didn't play it so well, you didn't get it to where you want it to go. I might need to move a bit more aggressively to, to, to make that shot next time. So it's by looking backwards do, do we are likely to progress in the game. So yeah. That, yeah. that happens for batters and happens for bowlers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we've spoken before about, you described it before as a sci-fi thriller. I 
think about it as a certainly from a bowler's point of view as a pick your own adventure you've there's a lot happening in your control out of your control what balls can you bowl what batters on strike what does he like to do where's the short boundary where's the wind all this kind of stuff but before i make the decision on the ball i'm about to bowl i need to think about who's on strike when have I bowled to him before in this match, in this tournament, in previous years? What does he like to score? All that, like you said, looking back allows you to make the right decision. Yeah. And that's being aware of those things that we talked about, those uncontrollables. You just talk then about precisely that, the things yeah. you don't control, but you need to be aware of. And then yeah. you go back into you, into your zone, and then you take control of your performance. So yeah. you know, I think that's, you know that that's pretty important uh it's important for uh, we as coaches as well that we encourage the players in our charge to lean on us but not to rely on us we want independent thinking cricketers out there that sort of have got have got some problem solving skills so that's why communication and that backward and forwards you know in training sessions in matches and across seasons are really important to a player's development so they've got to stand on their own feet at the end of the day so um, by encouraging that lean in uh, not rely on i think is an important part of of, of the, the nuance absolutely uh, yeah excellent and, and these days mental health is a really important part of of the of the whole game as well and so that's why understanding you know mental skills and what that means is 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 a challenge for coaches you know I'm, I'm no expert whatsoever in this field uh, but i'm i'm learning by the day about how to how to deal with players that are dealing with failure because you know players like in your level are playing for their livelihood the youngsters aren't yet they might have an ambition to one day but success and failure can still rock them yep. or they can feel as though they're letting down their teammates in the team or the club Yep. by not performing at the level of expectation around them so coaches need to be aware how to manage you know those circumstances that you don't have to be elite to worry about your output in a game and it's how to how to bring back balance and positivity and get up off the ground and take on the next challenge and and we get to enjoy that process of success and failure because that's what the game is but we need to understand that and, and navigate and be flexible around that. We need to encourage fearless behaviour and fearless performance, uh, whether that's red ball or white ball cricket. Yep. You know, fearless and brave performance in red ball cricket with the bat is batting a day. Uh, in, in, in T20 cricket, it is about taking the brave option sometime. You need to know that, you know, this ball needs to, we need to keep up with that 10 runs and over rate. Uh, I need to take and elevate my risk here. Am I going to take that choice? Or sometimes it is to hold the tension and not take that option. Yep. So there's always different sides of the coin and fearless can be both of those. It can be holding the tension or taking it on. So, you know, they're worthy things to talk about if you identify them in a game when someone makes a really good call, you know, back it in in your post match and, and get your team to celebrate it. Yep. From a bowling point of view, you know, it's nailing that Yorker or wide Yorker or whatever. It's the team gather around, well done, celebrate, uh, promote positivity and optimism uh, and, and, and good performance. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ship. We'll, we might try to move on to some questions if that's okay. What do you think? Yeah, no worries. Ready good. To go. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure there's anything else we left out. Um, this is a really good question um, uh, from AJ and I guess from the coach's point of view of having to look back to move to progress forward. He's got how do you prepare for a session and decide what you want to achieve out of that session? So that's quite a broad question. But if I think about if you're in the middle of a big bash campaign and you can sense the ship needs a little bit of riding and you've got a, maybe a training session to do that. Um, how would you prepare for that particular session and, and try to set yourself some goals to achieve some outcomes there that might right the ship a little bit? Yeah, you know, I guess if we if when we're reviewing our last performance and let's say we had five uh, five guys hold out 
you know, on the boundary, straight down the throat of the magnet, who's the guy out deep. Uh, and isn't it remarkable in our game how there he is, he's positioned at mid on, positioned at mid on or deep mid wicket, and the ball just goes straight there. Don't have to move. It's it's absolutely incredible that that still happens and that we don't, at least from a batting point of view, make a move to catch us. Uh, <laughs> So in that in that instance, we'd be saying to the group, oh, let's consider you know some ground balls as well. So we might have a circumstance and a focus where you know you've got to hit a ball that satisfies you along the ground before you think the next shot you're playing is going aerial. Yep. And so we have this bit of by play in the session where we've created a circumstance where we're just reminding the player on the ground in the air or we need them to play through squash, punch, crunch, and deflect. They need to get a deflection shot in there because we're scoring no runs down there. Yeah. Um, or we're scoring no runs into this zone, or we didn't score any twos this time because you know we were all or nothing. So we're, we're, we're saying that in preparation in the training session and, and in reverse from a bowling point of view, you know, we, we might be challenging lengths or pace or angles around the wicket, you know, uh, we might be having all sorts of little scenarios around what we're looking for our bowlers to do. Um, so it is about setting the scene and giving the, the squad a focus. That might mean it's for a third of the session, not the whole session. So you're, you're moving in and out of, of those coaching opportunities. Yep. Excellent. Very, very tangible answers. Thank you there, Matt. Piper has asked, uh, I'm a younger coach of 12-year-old kids. I, I want them to know about the game, but not sure if I ask them, they'd have any idea what's happening in it. Um, have you got any tips? I might be throwing you on the spot here, Ship, but you've got some grandkids and things. Have you got any ideas of how to talk to 12-year-olds about the game of cricket or to get them more interested in it? Oh, well, I think the fact that they're there is a, is a good signal that they're interested in it. So it's our job, I guess, to sort of uh, make the make the chaos that cricket can be clear in their minds and make the complex simple. So, yeah. you know, it can be a really, you know, complex game and we're, we're trying to dumb it down for them. We're trying to introduce simple concepts to them. So I think it's important that you, you know, you again, you might, uh, you know, train for five or 10 minutes and bring them in and have a conversation about the good things you saw. Yeah. Oh, Johnny, that, you know, Johnny, those cut shots are really fantastic and, and Amy, your bowling line and length is terrific. I've seen you take, you know, three wickets there, bowled three times. Uh, that was great. Uh, get them talking about how people are getting out, uh, how bowlers are taking wickets. These are all things that sort of elevate into their minds, you know, how batters might be scoring runs or how they might be losing their wickets. And from a bowling point of view, how they might be taking wickets. So. Uh, I think there's, you know, it's all about conversation. In, and when you talk about team as well, team skills or team fundamentals, you know, when they're at the cricket, it's about sitting together, watching the game, and you're in amongst them as the coach. Not, It's nice to be over with dads and mums and dads on the other side of the ground, but you, you need to be in amongst them and having those little prompting yeah. conversations uh, about what they're seeing out there and throwing the question out to the player and seeing what comes back your way. Yeah. Um, and you might be surprised with the answers that you get. Yeah, perfect. Um, uh, Craig, one of our, our coaches uh, within our academy here at Cricket New South Wales has asked, uh, how would you differ from an under 18 Colts team, say, uh, or a regionally based underage team to an elite organisation? How I would change in what respect do you do you mean? I, how, I how think you approach I'll, coaching that side in T20. Then uh, the... yeah, I wouldn't be coaching any different. I walked into that high performance rookies group that I talked okay. about, who were under 15. You know, high level under 15s had good skills, but taught, said to them, I would be coaching them like I'm coaching the Victorian Bush Rangers. So yeah. I'm walking through the door with the mentality that. I'm giving you first class information here and it's how you then use that and work with that. So give them elite concepts and let them discover how they're going to play with, with, with those things. And so 
I guess that means from a coaching point of view, you need to go and do your homework around what they might be or what yep. you see that they might be. Um, so I, I'd be piling that onto them and then seeing how it goes. Uh, yep. You want training to be combative and contestable and with, with variety. Uh, and, and again, you like to identify the winners, you know, on the night and there'll be over time those things will chop and change and everyone will get their moment in the sun. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Um, Barry has asked, or has commented, everything I've learned about player management starts with connection and trust, which I think you would be a massive advocate for. Um, he's watched a number of shows that you might be interested in, uh, Greg. They're called All of Nothing on Amazon, which are a great series that Amazon do. And he says, the coaches seem to yell a lot at their players. Do you ever yell at your players? Uh, not anymore. I think in my early days uh, down in Tasmania where we had a few more challenges uh, and we had to shift behaviour quite aggressively, there might have been times uh, where I heard in that sense, but it might have also been part of the theatre when you're a performer, you know, there, and, and as well at different times in Victoria, you know, I, I, I put a show on, I, I made it clear that I was disappointed with certain things from time to time, where I thought the guys had swum outside the flags, so to speak, and uh, they needed pulling back into you know, to the road rules, which we had all agreed to was our team plan and it served us very well. Yep. But there were times when, you know, that didn't happen. So, yes, aggressive from time to time, but certainly in recent years, experience teaches me that um, soft skills are the way, you know, to go now. You can still be direct and you can still be on point, uh, but the ability to, I agree, connect, communicate, uh, control your message, uh, control the emotions of the of the player um, and yourself. Um, we don't always get that right. Coaches make mistakes as well. So, you know, if you feel as though you made one, you dust yourself off and you, you know, and you go again. Uh, and, and and that's just like a, a player has to as well. So, um, yeah, uh, I've been a lot more restrained. Still get nervous about the results because I love winning. Uh, so I still get edgy and and anxious about results, um, but uh, yeah, pretty, there's it, a lot happening internally uh, versus, you know, externally these days. Yeah, just a, a couple more, uh, Greg. One that's that just popped to mind uh, as you were talking there. Do you reflect your own performance sort of after matches or throughout a tournament? Oh, I'm sure you would do it at the end of a tournament, but do you, do you purposefully track your performance as a coach and how do you think you're going? Absolutely, yes. I mean, if, 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 we're, if we're encouraging the players to get better and review and evaluate uh, as, as part of that, uh, you know, I'm doing that for myself as well. There's the vision. This is where, this is the plan, action myself. You know, how did I present today? How did, how did our systems run? What are the results we're doing and we're getting? I think in two years, fingers crossed, it keeps going. We never lost more than two games in a row. Which was a, which, which I think was a, an important uh, trait for the squad itself, but also the coaching team to have that, you know, we were able to readjust and reset um, and deal with failure and let it not derail us. So um, I, I guess yes, I'm very active in that, and I will ask the question of others. How did you think that went? And I'm not afraid to cop one between the, yep. between the eyes as well. So. Um, yeah, I'm actively uh, reviewing. That's excellent to know. Um, where do you, this is a really interesting question actually. I think I, I think I might know the answer, but I could be wrong. Um, where do you focus the most of your time as a T20 coach? A tactician, increasing a player's skill level or man management? Uh, I, know you, I know you would do all of them, but would you say that there's one that stands out? Um, I, 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 yes, I do do all of them. They're all important. I would say now for me, I'm lucky enough to be in a position to, it's more involved with man management. I, I think it's about, you know, it was last year for us, it's, you know, a bit like watching the rugby last night and the football teams that won 
acknowledge the group outside of the playing 11 or yeah. in, or the other number for rugby, which I'm not uh, up to speed on. 17, is it? Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, there, there you go. Uh, but they did reflect on the wider group. And so I guess the ability to get 18 game ready players was really important for us. And so all our players, we felt as though were ready to step in and perform. And so mm -hmm. it was about managing those that, you know, weren't getting a game and keeping them up and about and developing skills and maintaining that mental, you know, freshness uh, that was important to keeping them across a two month tournament, you know, ready to ready to perform. And I think we, we played every single one of our players. The artillery arrived beautifully for us in terms of Smith and Hazelwood last year to get the job done, which certainly didn't hurt. Uh, but man management, really critical uh, uh, to help the player find that consistency uh, across the course of a season. You know, developing leadership along the way. I'd often go to walk for walks with my subset of leaders and, and tap into what they were thinking mm -hmm. and giving them the feeling that they were making a significant contribution to the strategic direction of the side and also taking the youngsters away and having conversations around, you know, all of that, how they were dealing with not being involved as directly in their key roles that we talked about before. Uh, so communication, yeah, really important. Yeah. Uh, two more, one from Luke. Uh, what makes a coach a coachable player in your view and how might you work with other players that might not fit as much in that mould? Well, really good question, mm -hmm. uh, coachable players. Uh, when we're trying to identify talent that we want to walk through the door, I'm looking at three key characteristics. I'm looking for someone uh, who's humble, hungry and smart, all right? So humble is about that, that presentation, the player that walks in, that he's got, he's got ears that are open, he's yeah. prepared to give feedback, he's prepared to ask questions. You feel as though if you ask him a question, there's, there's honesty coming back at you. So, um, you know, humble team, individual, personal values are important. Um, Hungry is about work ethic, commitment to want to get better. Commit, you know, and you see that in the in in the in the training habits, the physical habits. You, you know that if you've asked the question about an opposition player, they've done their homework. And yep. so, you know, there's that's hungry to get better. Um, really, really important. And and smart is about someone who doesn't have to be intellectually smart, but you get the feel is is invested and involved in the game. They drink the game. Um, they're a student of the game. They're there to develop their cricket intellect uh, and, they're, and, and they're wanting to be a part of a group as well as have them see themselves, yeah. you know, racing up the ladder uh, of success. So that's what we look for when we're identifying the types of coachable person and where they're falling down in that area. We try and give them a nudge into that space. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, mate. Um, I've got one from John, which I, I'll just comment on. How do you divert from the traditional coaching or to T20 and keep the stalwarts uh, at your club on side? Um, how old are you, Greg? Uh, well, I'm 63 now, so, <laughs> and my son's play at a, at a suburban club, and, and yeah, there's a lot of people my age that are watching the game and people that are in the 40s and 50s who really still, you know, they've grown up in the in the red ball environment. Uh, the youngsters, my son who's 19, yeah. basically all he's known is playing white ball cricket. Rarely do they get a red ball game in in these days. So, um, you know, it's, it's still about respecting all of those formats, understanding that those fundamentals and basics you know, don't change really. The, the red ball stuff is you've got more time, you've got more opportunity to, you know, adjust within the game and, and still stay in the game. And so it, 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 in, in one sense, it's an easier format of the game to play, but to be embraced. T20 cricket, that's the challenge of the brain and the mind, you know, let's get into it. And, um, you know, that that's, uh, that's what a lot of the, the youngsters are after these days is to be 
is to be challenged uh, on the put on the spot and to come up with solutions um, to the problems that unfold before their eyes. Yeah, I would say to get the stalwarts on your side, A, show them this recording when it goes public, and B, curiosity is the lubricant for progress, as Shippy said earlier. So remind them of that and tell them that 2020 still has a lot to a lot to learn for everyone in terms of fundamentals of the game. Um, I try and I try and I try and share with my players. Sorry, debating there, Josh. That's okay. Uh, we're getting towards the end. That I say to the players, you know, when they walk through the door, that their smile is their logo, their personality is their business card, and but it's the way they leave their teammates and their coaches feeling after them being a part of the system is their trademark. Keep working on your trademark so that you're you can give yourself a big tick at the end of each session or at the end of each season or indeed each game as well. So, you know, it can be a short term thing or indeed a long term process. So that's a nice little full stop, I guess, to most sessions that I involve myself with. Yeah, excellent, Greg. Thank you. And we've just ticked out. We've ticked down to 100 attendees. It's 8.20 on a Monday night. So thank you to everyone that's been involved. One more question for all the lucky people on the line. As a coach, who do you turn to when you need a coach for yourself? Oh, good question. So um, I'll, I'll often go to my senior players as well. And, you know, I have a, a supporting ring of coaches and uh, we've got some terrific ones there at the Sydney Sixers, Gav Twining um, and Andre Adams, um, Mitchy Clayton, a new, a new coach coming into the into the fray I've had in the past uh, Jeff Lawson as well who provides me with with you know cricket observations that are at an elite level uh, so you know that's the group around Sydney uh, but I do like talking to my senior players um, you know in obviously Moses, Dan Hughes, Jordan Silk, Stephen O'Keefe is a wonderful person to bounce ideas off about the game um, and, and to, to see if you're a specialist, if you like, coming from a background of batting, it's nice to get, um, you know, the bowler's point of view as well, even though at one stage I was uh, an honorary member of the Australian fast bowling. No, uh, untrue. <laughs> well, lucky to get invited into their pre-game meetings, uh, which, was, which was a wonderful experience uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, they're the sort of people uh, that I, I turn to from time to time. I'm lucky enough to talk to uh, Ricky Ponting still about the game, Justin Langer about the game, Andrew McDonald about the game. Uh, and so, you know, there's 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 rich sources of information all around. Yeah. Thank you, mate. And then just a bit of a slightly humorous one uh, to finish. You had some time at the Delhi Daredevils in the IPL and you mentioned um, that you had the uh, the challenging um, occupation of having to tell maybe two players of, if you had to pick a test team of the 2000s, Glenn McGrath and Dan Vittori are probably both in there and you've had to you've had to drop them both from a team before. Can you run us through how that went? Well, isn't it it's an amazing thing? And that was the IPL. You had, you had eight internationals on your on your list and, and, f and four could only play. And so... Um, Fortunately, the start of year one, Glenn was in the team, Dan Vittori was in the team, and it was McGrath, Vittori, A.B. de Villiers, and, wow. and Dilshan were, were the four that did play. But as time rolled on, uh, and we got other people in the team like Dirk Nanez bowling 155 Rockets and David Warner coming into the team, and uh, Dan Vittori being part of the selection uh, panel, <laughs> would say, I don't think I fit into the team today, uh, Greg. And so, you know, he fell on his own sword at different times. So, I, you know, we, I thanked him for that. But, you know, what a true professional, you know, could see as desperate as, as he was to play, you know, he stepped aside for someone else's opportunity in terms of team balance. And Glenn McGrath, my God, having to tell him that he was missing out, you know, I was, that was one of the most nervous times or times that I had to be involved one-to-one -one with a player. But again, thorough gentleman, thorough professional, you know, took it on the chin. And uh, 
you know, got around the rest of his group and and and, and we played away. So, um, you know, there were some awkward moments, of course, uh, having to do those sort of things. And there are awkward moments as, uh, moments as coaches when you have to transition players and, and that's a difficult skill to have to deal with. Um, and it doesn't get any easier whether you're uh, doing it for the first time or a hundred times. So, yeah, tough times, uh, but very memorable ones. All right. Thank you, Ship. Um, uh, Greg, sorry, more formal. Pat, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have a chat to you for about 15 minutes. Um, we managed to get through a couple of parts of the mini series there. I think probably a few more than what I thought. So um, thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you to everyone who's been on tonight. Um, best of luck somewhat um, to the Sixers this year. I know you guys have got an excellent list uh, together again, and more importantly, an excellent off-field group. So uh, thank you again. Have you got any words of wisdom to finish with? No, just uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, it's been really, uh, it's been a pleasure to be on. I love talking to coaches. Uh, obviously, invested in the in the process. And as I said at the start, you know, hats off to all you coaches that are still on the line or or dialed in tonight. And uh, enjoy the season. Uh, enjoy your um, enjoy the the process you're involved in. Uh, you, your community needs you, and you're doing a wonderful job. Uh, on behalf of the kids that you're coaching and the clubs you're representing. So, um, you know, come, come to our games, enjoy our games and uh, have a fantastic season ahead. Perfect. Couldn't have said it better. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and we'll be in touch. Thank you.